Good evening, Brian, and welcome to the Lodge Hope of Karachi number 337 and our lockdown lecture series. This is meeting number 63, I, I believe. It's a great pleasure to have you all back here. Uh, there's over 80 of us so far, which is a fantastic number, particularly because the sun is shining outside. Uh, Brian, can I remind you, as ever, of the Grand Lodge of Scotland guidelines to Zoom meetings? Please keep your camera on. If you do struggle with the, your bandwidth, Brian, please just drop me a message in the chat. And please have a name that I recognise, uh, as that way we can keep in line with what our masters in George Street tell us. Thank you so much. Can I also invite you all to sign the virtual tile on our Facebook pages? That gives us a, a record of who's been with us, uh, not just tonight, but over the last 14 or 15 months. Brian, this evening, I, last week we were uh, out of the world, I, but this week we brought it back and we've brought you some culture. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to, to welcome along Brother Alan Beck, who is a past master of uh, number 12 at Greenock. He's the Provincial Grand Secretary uh, of Renfrewshire uh, West, uh, one of the smallest provinces, uh, and some say the premier province uh, of uh, the Grand Lodge of Scotland. There is a lot of debate over that, Brian. However, uh, past Provincial Grand Master Alec O'Brien is not here this evening to, to challenge that. Uh, however, Brother Beck, uh, what a talented man, Brian. Uh, he was trained at the Royal Scottish Academy of Music and Drama, and he's won so many singing competitions uh, over the years. It's fantastic. And he, he's, uh, he made his operatic debut in 1995 for Opera Ireland, and he was a principal tenor with the State Opera in Stuttgart from 1996 to 2002. Uh, Alan, I was in Germany about 10 years before you, and I did a lot of singing, uh, but I was singing in the NAFI, uh, so slightly different to uh, the type of singing you're going to talk to us about this evening. Uh, Alan's also a big Burns man, past president of the Greenwich Burns Club, which to many of you will be known as the Mother Club, and he's currently the junior vice president of the Robert Burns World Federation, and he's much in demand on the Burns circuit, both as a singer and a speaker. Uh, he's sung all around the world, Bren. Uh, but I do have uh, a, another little insight into him, that he's also a friend of one of Facebook's favourite TV personalities, and I think he's an honorary member of the Judith Ralston Appreciation Society, Bren, uh, and there's one for her and Kat Shearer, uh, and there was a disappointing news that Kat Katrina Shearer is moving on from BBC after 16 years today, so hopefully we keep Judith uh, giving us the weather, Alan, so if you've got any input there, please ensure that happens. With that, Brother Alan Beck, the virtual floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much, Right Washroom Master um, and Brethren. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to have been invited here to speak to you this evening um, on a subject which uh, I've got a lot of passion for. Um, Mozart has been um, a hero of mine for quite a number of years, which is not what you would normally expect to hear from a working class boy from Coatbridge. But um, it's absolutely true. Um, I, um, I first was involved in Mozart, uh, singing Mozart arias as a young student. Um, and then you'll hear later about my uh, experiences in the magic flute uh, in Scottish opera. Um, this um, presentation has been uh, put together over a period of time. Uh, I've been very interested in um, uh, the whole idea of Mozart and his Masonic connections. So, gentlemen, sit back and we'll begin. So, brethren, welcome to uh, Mozart, Masonry and the Magic Flute. And there you'll see him. There's the man himself. 
He is, of course, Brother Johannes Christostomus Wolfgangus Theopolis Mozart. Um, as I said, a huge, huge hero of mine. Mozart was born in Salzburg on the 27th of January, 1756, and he died in Vienna on December the 5th, 1791. There you'll see uh, two paintings of Mozart. The, the one on the left is actually posthumous. It's probably the most famous painting of Mozart, but obviously not having photography at the time, uh, Barbara Kraft, who, um, who painted that portrait, really probably didn't have um, as good an idea of what Mozart looked like than Josef Hinkel, who painted uh, in 1783, the Mozart on the right-hand side. Um, both famous paintings, but um, neither of them, I suppose, really giving Mozart um, in his true genius, very difficult to see genius, but genius he certainly was. Um, Mozart was a musician capable of playing multiple instruments. He started playing at the age of six uh, in public, and over the years he aligned himself with a variety of European venues and patrons, and he composed literally hundreds of works, uh, sonatas, symphonies, masses, concertos, and operas, and they're all marked by vivid emotion and sophisticated textures. So why is Mozart so famous? There are lots of composers, but why do we all know Mozart? Well, he's definitely, if not the greatest composer of all time. He's certainly one of the greatest composers of all time. And with music like this, you can see why.
afraid, brethren, that for someone like myself, um, it's not actually finding the Mozart that you want to play. It's pressing the stop button that I find difficult. Um, Mozart's one of the most prolific composers of all time. He was 36 when he died and he composed more than 600 works. The majority of these are acknowledged as the absolute pinnacles of Western classical music, symphonic, concertante, chamber, operatic, and choral music. Um, 21 piano con uh, sonatas, 27 piano concertos, 41 symphonies, 18 masses, 13 operas, nine oratorios and cantata, two ballets, 40 plus concertos for various other instruments, string quartets, trios, quintets, violin, piano duets, etc., etc., etc. This outstanding output includes hardly one work which is less than a masterpiece. So why is he so famous? Well, he's also one of the most unnaturally gifted composers of all time. Have a listen to this. Now, brethren, you're listening to that and you're probably thinking to yourself, well, yeah, that was good. It was good, but it, it wasn't anywhere near as good as the pieces that he played before. So why is he playing as that piece and why are we talking about him being naturally or unnaturally gifted? Well, Mozart composed that when he was four years of age. Um, the unfortunate thing about doing a Zoom presentation for this is I can't see your faces at the moment when I tell you that. But that piece of music was composed by a four-year-old. Most four-year-olds who are playing with their Lego couldn't contemplate anything like that. Not only could Mozart compose that, he could also play it at the age of four. But also his first symphony was composed at the age of eight. Eight, brethren, is when you're in primary four. Um, and his first opera at 11, that's when you're in primary seven. So he was definitely one of the most naturally, or as I say, unnaturally gifted composers of all time. But he was also one of the fastest composers of all time. Listen to this. This is the Overture for Don Giovanni. So that's about the last minute and minute and 20 seconds of that particular overture to Mozart's opera Don Giovanni. And the whole overture is probably about seven minutes. This is one of my favorite memes. If you ever feel bad about procrastinating, just remember that Mozart wrote the overture to Don Giovanni the morning that it premiered. It kind of was too busy rehearsing the whole thing thinking I'll write an overture, I'll write an overture, got there on the morning of it and thought to himself, I haven't written an overture. And he wrote the overture for that opera that morning. So he was quite a fast 
composer. He was also famous because he's one of the most influential composers of all time. Mozart is incredibly popular and he's enduringly popular. His influence on subsequent Western art music is absolutely enormous. And here are just a range of people who spoke about Mozart who were incredibly influenced. This is brother Franz Josef Haydn. Haydn was actually more famous than Mozart during his life because Haydn got on with folk. Mozart didn't. Mozart was quite headstrong and told people where to get off, whereas Haydn played the game. Haydn was incredibly uh, famous and he was courted by emperors and kings and um, a very, very famous man of his time. Uh, he said, scarcely any man can brook comparison with the great Mozart. If I could only impress on the soul of every friend of music and on high personages in particular, how inimitable are Mozart's works, how profound, how musically intelligent, how extraordinarily sensitive, for this is how I understand them, how I feel them. Why then, the nations would vie with each other to possess such a jewel within their frontiers. Posterity will not see such a talent again in a hundred years. I believe that posterity hasn't seen such a talent again. So that's brother Franz Josef Haydn. And here is someone who will also be famous to you, brother Ludwig van Beethoven. Uh, I've put brother with a wee question mark and I'll tell you why in a minute. Beethoven was taught by Mozart in Vienna, and after Mozart had died, he was taught by Haydn, and he considered Mozart the greatest of composers, and he was so influenced by Mozart that he worried that his own early compositions had actually plagiarized from the countless pieces of Mozart that he had learned and performed, because he just felt that he absorbed all his music from Mozart. But why did I say brother? Well, three of Beethoven's biographers state that he was a Freemason. Uh, the adagio of his seventh quartet bears the superscription, a weeping willow or an acacia over the grave of my brother. Now, of course, at that time, both of Beethoven's natural brother, brothers were alive when this work was written. So they weren't in their grave. So they have a certain Masonic connection. Uh, Schindler, uh, who was also a Freemason and knew Beethoven very well. Schindler mentions a handshake when he visited the composer and said, a grip of our hands, said the rest. Beethoven also wrote a song, What is the Mason's Aim?, which was written in 1806 for the Loge de Frère Courage à l'Orient de Bonn, which means the Lodge of Courageous Brothers of the Orient of Bonn. Um, and his presence at a number of Masonic concerts, which were given with full Masonic rites in regalia, is well documented. So presumably, in order to have been able to have been allowed in, um, he must have been at least initiated into the craft. There are other composers who were incredibly influenced by Mozart, and this particular one is uh, very interesting. This is a guy called Antonio Salieri. Salieri was appointed Kapellmeister to the Emperor of Austria in 1788, and he chose to revive Mozart's magic flute, uh, sorry, Marriage of Figaro, instead of composing his own opera for the piece. Now, that's not because Salieri couldn't compose operas. He was quite a prolific composer of opera himself. But rather than do what everyone else does, which is to write their own opera and be the big I am, he decided that he was going to revive Mozart's marriage of Figaro when he took that post. Then when he went to the coronation festivities of Leopold II in 1790, he had no fewer than three Mozart masses, the scores of them, the, the musical notes of them in his luggage because he studied Mozart all the time. They wrote a cantata for voice and piano together, which is called uh, The Recuperation to Health of Ophelia. And then speaking enthusiastically of Salieri's attendance at a performance of the Magic Flute, Mozart said, and he's talking about Salieri, he heard and saw with all his attention and from the overture to the last choir, there was not a piece that didn't elicit a bravo or bello out of him. So Mozart's actually describing how much Salieri would cheer at Mozart's pieces 
But we have a different opinion of Salieri, and it's because of a Peter Schaeffer play called Amadeus. This is one of my favourite films, and it's a bit fanciful. The relationship between Mozart and uh, and Salieri is a, a wee bit a wee bit fanciful. Um, they were clearly rivals, but they ha- they were rivals with a great amount of respect for one another. But here um, we see. Salieri, and this is Salieri you see in the middle of the picture just now, Salieri hearing his first taste of Mozart and seeing the composer for the first time. And the way he describes this music, I think, is fantastic. On the page, it looked nothing. The beginning simple, almost comic. Just a pulse, bassoons, basset horns, like a rusty squeeze box. And then, suddenly, high above it, an oboe. A single note hanging there, unwavering. So what you saw there was Salieri in a mental institution, in an asylum, um, remembering his first meeting with Mozart and the first time he heard that piece. Um, the, the, the piece is, that this film Amadeus is all flashback um, by Salieri. And here, Salieri is uh, speaking to Mozart's wife. Salieri is, um, has been asked to look at the works of other composers who are all applying for a job uh, to teach the the daughter of the emperor. And what's interesting about this is that Mozart was so um, unbelievably talented that generally speaking, Mozart never made copies of anything. If you look at Beethoven's work, you'll see so many parts of it scored out and there's arrows pointing to this bit and then there's extra bars written here and they're scored out and then there's Mozart's was never like that Mozart only ever wrote things out once and they were perfect and in a sense that means that they were all composed in his head every other composer composes at the piano Mozart composed in his head and simply wrote it down so there were no mistakes and this particular scene is Salieri as a young man interviewing Mozart's wife and this is exactly what he discusses are you sure you can't leave this and, and come back again? It's very tempting, sir. Mm. But it's impossible, I'm afraid. Wolfgang would be frantic if he found those were missing. You see, they're all originals. Originals? Yes, sir. He doesn't make copies. Mm-hmm. 
beyond belief. These are first and only drafts of music. But they showed no corrections of any kind. Not one. He had simply written down music already finished in his head. After page of it, as if he were just taking dictation. <laughs> and music finished as no music is ever finished. Brethren, I can't recommend Amadeus to you enough. The performances are fantastic. In fact, both of the main actors, Salieri and Mozart, were nominated for Oscars, and the actor there, F. Murray Abraham, won the Best Actor Oscar for that role. These are what other composers said about him. So Rossini said, Beethoven, I can take twice a week, but Mozart, every day. Chopin, Mozart encompasses the entire domain of musical creation, but I've got only the keyboard in my poor head. Wagner, the most tremendous genius, raised Mozart above all masters in all centuries and in all of the arts. Gounod, before Mozart, all ambition turns to despair. Who has reached the extreme limits of scale with the same infallible precision, equally guarded against the false refinement of artificial elegance and the roughness of spurious force? Who has better known how to breathe anguish and dread into the purest and most exquisite forms. Mozart, prodigal heaven gave thee everything, grace and strength, abundance and moderation, perfect equilibrium. Brahms, it's a real pleasure to see music so bright and spontaneous expressed with corresponding ease and grace. Sansa, give Mozart a fairy tale and he creates without effort an immortal masterpiece. Leonard Bernstein, Mozart's music is constantly escaping from its frame because it cannot be contained in it. Mozart combines serenity, melancholy, and tragic intensity into one great lyric improvisation. Over it all hovers the greater spirit that is Mozart's, the spirit of compassion, of universal love, even of suffering, a spirit that knows no age that belongs to all ages. Tchaikovsky, Mozart is the highest, the culminating point that beauty has attained in the sphere of music. Mozart is the musical Christ. Schubert, a light, bright, fine day, this will remain throughout my whole life, as from afar, the magic notes of Mozart's music still gently haunt me. What a picture of a better world you have given us, Mozart. And this last one. Mozart is the greatest composer of all. Beethoven created his music, but the music of Mozart is of such purity and beauty that one feels he merely found it, that it has always existed as part of the inner beauty of the universe waiting to be revealed. And that quote was from Albert Einstein. So, that's why Mozart's famous, but let's go back and have a look a little bit at the historical context. So here you will see the Holy Roman Empire in yellow. 
this was a multi-ethnic complex of territories in Central Europe. Um, the largest territory was the Kingdom of Germany, but it also included Bohemia, Burgundy, Italy, and the Archdukedom of Austria, along with numerous smaller territories. And here you'll see Salzburg, which is where Mozart was born, and Vienna, which is where Mozart died. The Holy Roman Empire was made up of countless little countries, eventually hundreds of them. And they were all individual entities which were governed by kings and dukes and counts, etc., and princes. And here you'll see all these different colors represent a different part of the Holy Roman Empire. Um, absolutely massive and so many different languages and different races of people and cultures of people all controlled from Vienna. But this particular guy here was Mozart's first real employment uh, employer. He was uh, the Prince Archbishop of Salzburg, Heronius, Count of Colorado. Um, so he was a Prince Archbishop. The Holy Roman Empire, of course, was heavily uh, indebted to the Roman Catholic Church at the time. Mozart's father, brother Johann Georg Leopold Mozart, actually worked for the, um, the, uh, the Prince Archbishop, and there is brother Mozart Sr. there. Um, he was also a composer, he was a teacher, he was a violinist, and he recognized his son's genius at the age of three. He took Mozart and his sister on a tour of Europe to Munich, Vienna, Paris, The Hague, and London, and they played for kings, they played for emperors, and they played for the Pope. And because of that, Mozart, the son, was made a knight of the Order of the Golden Spur by Pope Clement the Fourteenth. Mozart's sister said about Mozart, he often spent much time at the keyboard picking out thirds which he was forever striking and his pleasure showed that it sounded good. He could play faultlessly with the greatest delicacy. So even as a small child, he was incredibly musical as he played. That's his sister who was also a superb keyboard player. Anyway, back to the Prince Archbishop. So he employed Mozart as a court musician, and now Mozart was able to spend his time uh, composing. For the Prince Archbishop, he wrote five violin concertos. He began composing piano concertos, but the, the Prince Archbishop closed the theater because he thought theater was scandalous because um, the types of people who were in it, not the same nowadays, I'm sure. Um, so there was no scope for Mozart composing opera and that really bothered him, as did the money that he earned, which was the equivalent today of 5,000 pounds. So Mozart got the chance to compose an opera, a Domineo, uh, and it was premiered in January 18, uh, 1781. He went to Vienna with the Salzburg court uh, and the emperor offered him a concert and that concert was paying about today's equivalent of about two and a half thousand pounds. So that was half of Mozart's yearly salary. Um, Prince Archbishop wasn't pleased and Mozart thought too bad and he resigned. The Prince Archbishop was even less pleased and he sent some heavies round and they, they beat Mozart up. Um, yeah. Um, in late 18, 1781, he won the Vienna keyboard competition. And early the following year, the emperor commissioned a new opera, Seraglio, which was in German. The lead character was named Constanza, and that was uh, because Mozart had just married a woman called Constanza. They had six children together. And there is Constanza Mozart. Uh, that's the that's actually what she looked like. That's a contem uh, contemporary painting. And she's the one who was in that previous uh, clip from Amadeus. He started a very successful concert series that year. Um, and he started the thing that was his big downfall. He started to adopt a very expensive lifestyle, which he could afford because of the money from the concert series. He met Haydn, uh, 
at the time who wrote to the emperor to say that he considered Mozart the greatest composer ever. And in December 1784, he was initiated into the Lodge zur Voltätigkeit, which means the Lodge of Beneficence. Two weeks later, Haydn applied to join another lodge, which was zur Waren Eintracht to Concord, also in Vienna. So whether or not the fact that Mozart was joining spurred Haydn on to join, Haydn was a, quite a bit older than Mozart. Um, in 1795, he began to write, that should be 1785, I must change that. He began to write The Marriage of Figaro. And this scandalized the Austrian court because Figaro is about a servant being more intelligent than his master. And if you were a nobleman at the time where things were starting to go wrong for monarchies. Uh, the French Revolution was literally around the corner. Um, you didn't really want to encourage plays which showed um, that your servants were more intelligent than you. Um, Mozart died uh, the following year, and that same year Mozart had the premiere of Don Giovanni in Prague. Later that year, the new emperor appointed Mozart as the court composer to keep him in Vienna. Now, towards the end of the decade, his circumstances um, worsened because the concert series started to dry up. Uh, there was a war between Austria and Turkey and the general level of prosperity and the ability of the aristocracy to support music declined rapidly. So the Mozarts had to move out of Vienna because they still had that same lifestyle, but they just didn't have the money coming in. He borrowed heavily from uh, his wealthy Freemasonic connections. The opera Cosi Fan Tutti was premiered and it would have been a huge success. It was massively successful in its first five performances. People were raving about it. And then the emperor died and there had to be national mourning and that stopped any more performances. So there's a le uh, lesson for any of you who want to be performers. And I think all performers are struggling during COVID. Um, people only buy tickets for things when they've got money. And you can see that by this stage in Mozart's life, he was a slightly different looking person. Um, he wasn't keeping the best of health at this point. So the purpose of music in Masonic ceremonies is to spread good thoughts and unity above the members so that they may be united in the idea of innocence and joy. This was written in a contemporary edition of Mozart's Masonic songs. And music should in inculcate feelings of humanity, wisdom and patience, virtue and honor, loyalty to friends, and finally, an understanding of freedom. Mozart absolutely believed that, no question, otherwise he wouldn't have let that be published in his name. This is some of Mozart's Masonic music, which you may have heard. So he wrote four Masonic cantatas, five Masonic songs, and Masonic funeral music. The style of music used in Viennese Masonic lodges was much less uh, showy, it was much less virtuosic. It wasn't full of lots of ornaments, which was the type of stuff that Mozart would have been writing in his operas and things. Um, his style of music is often referred to as humanist and is in accord with this Masonic view of music. But by humanist, it doesn't mean someone who doesn't believe in God. It means actually in this particular time, someone who believes that, that man was imbued by God. Um, and that was definitely Mozart's belief. So in his final year, he had a period of personal recovery. 
And his major output, which includes uh, La Comenza di Tito, which was an opera, his final string quintet, his final piano concerto, his Requiem Mass, and his most famous choral piece, Ave Verum Corpus. Sit back and listen to this. Absolutely beautiful. In his final year, he had financial success. Uh, his debts were almost paid off. And in fact, the day after he, he, he died, his debts were paid off because of the money that was coming in from the magic flute at the time. A fellow Mason asked Mozart to compose a new opera on Masonic lines, the Zauberflute of the Magic Flute. This is a work incorporating a good deal of Masonic illusion and symbolism. To recognize this, we should think a little bit about the ritual used in Vienna in Mozart's time. So in the end of the apprentice degree, the candidate was actually required to be tried by the four elements of classical science, which is earth, air, fire, and water. And this occurs early in the initiation and once the, the brother passes through the four ordeals, he is qualified. And it's borrowed from uh, Luzinian mis uh, mysteries in which originally the ordeals were so extreme that they were frequently fatal. Um, the Grand Lodge of New York uh, has an Italian lodge where it's all done in Italian called the Garibaldi Lodge. And um, this is how they are tried in the entered apprentice degree from earth, air, fire and water. Der Vogelfänger bin ich ja, stets lustig heiße Obsassa. Ich Vogelfänger bin bekannt bei alt und jung im ganzen Land. Weiß mit dem Locken umzugehen und mich als Pfeifen zu verstehen. Drum kann ich froh und lustig sein, denn alle Vögel sind ja mein. I am a lad of widespread fame, and Papageno is my name. To tell the truth in simple words, I make my living catching birds. The moment they attract my eye, I spread my net and in they fly. I whistle on my pipes of pan and that makes me a happy man. Don't all applaud at once, brethren. Um, that was Papageno's aria from The Magic Flute. Uh, the words, the libretto of The Magic Flute was written by brother Emmanuel Schickenader, uh, although Mozart probably had quite a lot of input into it. Schickenader was a singer, actor, and impresario. Uh, he was a member of the lodges Zur Volketigkeit and Zur Neugekonnte Hoffnung, newly crowned hope. He didn't just write it and give it to Mozart to put to music, during the summer of 1791, 
Mozart moved into Schikaneder's house and they collaborated completely on the work so that when the music is all Mozart's, the libretto can be seen as a joint work. Um, the opera premiered on the 30th of September, 1791, with Schikaneder playing the, no the role of pa Papageno, which I just sang, and Mozart conducting and playing the Celeste. And there you see Schikaneder dressed as Papageno, who was the bird catcher. Papageno is really a kind of um, comic character because the magic flute is very like um, a pantomime, really. Here you see the Lodge of Beneficence. And if you look to the bottom right-hand side, you will see two gentlemen, one in a red coat, one in a blue coat, chatting to each other. The one on the left is Schikaneder, and the one on the right is Mozart. So Grout, who was a very respected musicologist, said that um, Schikaneder was like a literary magpie. He stole characters, scenes, incidents, and situations from others' plays and novels, and with Mozart's assistance, organized them into a libretto that ranges all the way from buffoonery to high solemnity, from childish fairy to sublime human aspiration, in short, from the circus to the temple, but never neglecting an opportunity for effective theater along the way. So the central theme of the magic flute is the return of harmony. And of course, Freemasonry is all about harmony, harmony within the universe. The flute is magic because it represents the balance of the four elements. So it's made of wood, which is grown from the earth. Um, it's made in a rainstorm. It was fashioned in a rainstorm. So of course it was surrounded by water. It was made amongst lightning. So there was fire around about the flute. And only a skilled person in harmony with the universe could give the air, the breath to the flute. So it's very Masonic. Uh, a worthy man seeking enlightenment must be proved by the trials of earth, air, fire, and water. And here you'll see some of the characters in the magic flute. Uh, magic flute, as I said, is, is almost like a pantomime in the sense that it's always kind of weird and wacky. Um, productions, very colourful costumes, um, and of course Papageno is very much like sort of, you know, the, the village idiot really, I suppose. Um, there you'll see Tamino with the magic flute in his hand. And there you'll see Zarastro, who I'm going to call the right worshipful master, and I'll explain why in a moment. And there's the villain of the piece, who represents darkness, the queen of the night. And you can start to see some Masonic imagery appearing in the magic flute. There's the right worshipful master with the brethren in the temple and the two new initiates. You might be saying, why is there a woman as an initiate? I'll also explain that later. Um, the magic flute is full of the number three. There are so many reference, references to three. Um, it could be three chords. So the overture is famous for the three chords or knocks, which distinguish it from other Mozart overtures. And also it relates to the temple scene in the opera. The music is written in E flat, which has got three flats. Uh, the first three chords represent the opening of the lodge and Tamino, trusting confused and unsettled and confident and balanced after passing his trials and becoming enlightened and aiming for higher things. So, of course, if you can imagine those as knocks, it's. Fairly Masonic. Uh, there are three ladies 
Um, back to the number three. The Queen of the Night has three ladies in waiting who attempt to lead the hero Tamino away from enlightenment and into darkness. There they are, the three ladies. There are three spirits. Zarastro, or the right worship master, sends three spirits to lead Pamina from the darkness of her mother's kingdom into the enlightenment of his temple. And there you see Pamina with the three spirits. Um, Pamina is a female because she represents the Austrian people. Um, so she represents um, the, the kind of motherland, I suppose. Um, so when you see Tamino and Pamina being initiated, it's Tamino and the Austrian people being led out of darkness into light. There are three pieces of a serpent. The serpent is killed by the three ladies and they slice him into three bits. And there is Tamino with the serpent just before he gets uh, cut up. So, there are temples in the magic flute, three temples. And upon these temples are inscriptions which refer to reason, nature, and wisdom. Also, obviously, of Masonic origin, as are the other references, including the final defeat of evil and darkness by the powers of goodness and light. There you see the right worship master with his brethren, Zarastro with his brethren outside the temple. And if you look at the jewel that he's wearing around his neck, and this is a picture of the original, uh, a drawing of the original uh, costumes, you'll see that it is the blazing sun in its splendor, um, which of course masters wear. There are two, I'll call them wardens, who, take Pamino, uh, Pamina and Tamino on their trial. These wardens have weapons. And in fact, they're known as armed men. Before Tamino enters the temple, he is met by a man who guards the door or who tiles the door. So you can see the Masonic illusions there. Magic Flute itself um, has the characters of the Queen of the Night. And the Queen of the Night is supposed to represent the Empress Maria Theresa. Now the Empress Maria Theresa was an enemy of Freemasonry. She actually banned Freemasonry in her time. And of course, the Queen of the Night uh, attempting to plunge the world into darkness was like Maria Theresa attempting to plunge Austria into darkness by not allowing Freemasonry. But of course, the hero, Tamino, is that an apron he's wearing? Um, he is uh, equated with the emperor. His Imperial Majesty, Brother Emperor Leopold II of the Holy Roman Empire, 18th degree Mason, and an exponent of enlightened absolutism. So Tamino represents the Emperor, who's a big style Mason, and 
the queen of the night represents the empress or actually his mother who is very very against freemasonry so to the freemasonry of the day symbolism was easily and broadly interpreted they saw the opera's queen of the night as no one other than their own empress maria teresa and the hero Tamino was as the good Emperor Leopold, and the heroine Pamina was the Austrian people itself. That was how they saw it, and it was fairly obvious. Magic Flute is a story of morality, veiled in allegory, and illustrated by signs and symbols through the education of mankind, progressing from chaos, the serpent, through religious superstition, the queen and the ladies, to rationalistic enlightenment, Zarastro and his brethren, by means of trial, Tamino, and error, Papageno, ultimately to make the earth a heavenly kingdom and mortals like the gods. Dann ist die Erde ein himmlich reich und sterblicher den Göttern gleich. This couplet is sung in the finales to both acts. So you can tell what we said about Mozart's ideas of humanistic Freemasonry is, is obvious there. The opera is all about balance and equilibrium and it shows things in several opposite ways. So you get simple and complicated music together. You get day and night together, good and evil together. And most notably, you get high and low pitches. This is definitely high pitches. And this is definitely low pitches. The gods decide such matters. Have a look, brethren, at the Masonic symbols here. The only thing I know that's lower than that is this. That's what friends are for. <laughs> um, brethren, by the way, if you can sing um, that first role of Queen of the Night, it's so high. It's one of that. It is probably the highest role in the operatic repertoire. Um, not that many sopranos can sing it. If you can sing it, then you can take a fee of about ten thousand pounds a performance. So the opera was premiered uh, on the thirtieth of September in Vienna. Mozart was very unwell, but nevertheless he conducted the orchestra and Schikaneda played Papageno, and the role of Queen of the Night was sung by Mozart's sister-in-law. It was a total and utter triumph. It drew immense crowds. 
it reached hundreds and hundreds of performances during the 1790s, most of which poor Mozart didn't get to see. His delight in its success is reflected in his last three letters written to his wife. I have this moment returned from the opera, which was as full as ever, he wrote on the 7th of October, listing the numbers that had to be encored. You can see how this opera is becoming more and more esteemed. He went on to hear his opera almost every night, taking along friends and relatives. His financial deal meant that he took 50% of the ticket sales and this would have enabled him to pay off his debts during his lifetime. But he died at home on December the 5th, 1791. We don't know exactly what he died of. The official record says it was Hitziger's Friesel fever, which is a, a, a military fever. And the reason that we don't know, um, we don't know what he died of is because we can't, get his body and do any DNA tests because Mozart was buried in a pauper's grave unmarked outside Vienna. We, we don't know where Mozart is. The Magic Flute began to make a triumphal progress through Germany's opera houses, great and small, and by the early 19th century, it spread to essentially all the countries of Europe and eventually everywhere in the world where opera is cultivated. Along with Carmen and La Boheme, it's the most frequently performed of all operas. Uh, for the 2016-17 season, there were over 500 different productions worldwide, totaling more than 3,000 performances. Imagine being on 50% of that. Mozart was interred in a common grave in accordance with contemporary Viennese custom at the St. Mark's Cemetery outside the city on the 7th of December. And if, as later reports say, no mourners attended, that is consistent with Viennese burial custom at the time, although Salieri and four other musicians were present. His modest funeral did not reflect his standing with the public as a composer. Memorial services and concerts in Vienna and Prague were extremely well attended. Indeed, in the period immediately after his death, his reputation rose substantially. There was an unprecedented wave of enthusiasm for his work. Biographies were written and publishers vied to produce complete editions of his works. And here are just a few, a few paintings from different parts of the life of the greatest composer of all time, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. Brother Alan Beck, what can I say but a huge, huge thank you on behalf of all the from all the members of Lodge Hope of Cratchit and all our guests here this evening for taking us through the life and times of Brother Mozart. Your own talent, sir, came to the fore with uh, your own singing there, but your love of your hero was certainly on show for everyone this evening to see. Uh, so, Alan, thank you so much. Uh, I know there's a good few questions in the chat. I saw them coming in very early on uh, in your presentation, which is uh, really good. Uh, if I can get to the first, the first question I did see, very early on, Alan, you mentioned masses, and Brother Ron Mann asks, what are masses? Um, so the, the, the Latin mass, which appears in, in, you know, in the Roman Catholic Church, um, is often set to music. Um, if you think about it, and if you think about the people who had money to commission works, I mean, nowadays, if you want to be a musician, well, you can, you know, you can get your guitar and you can go and compose some songs, you get some gigs and pubs and stuff like that. That wasn't really an option for people in those days. You had to be a talented composer and you had to have patronage. And the people who had the money, and I'm not being political here, but the people who had the money were the churches. 
Um, and so if you were a prince archbishop, then you wanted masses composed for your church so that the masses weren't just spoken by the priests, they were sung by the choir. So that's that's what we mean by masses. It's uh, requiem eternum and kiri eleison and, and all the different parts of the Latin mass that you get nowadays would be set to music by many, many composers, not just Mozart. Okay, thank you, Alan. Uh, so not as one of our wags said, loads of people, what are the masses? So... <laughs> Uh, I'd imagine that the Catholic Church in those days, there would have been loads of people. <laughs> uh, Eagle from New Finland says, Beethoven once said, I heard you used one of my songs in your Masonic meeting. Give it to me and I will change it. You will not be sorry. Is that something you've heard in your um, travels? The, 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 there's an even better quote um, by Handel who for his death march in Saul, which, which uh, is quite a, a well-known piece, and it, it's, um, I, I have a feeling actually it might even have been performed at the funeral of the Duke of Edinburgh, but certainly performed for monarchs and stuff like that. And someone said to Handel, you stole that from, and he mentioned another composer, and Handel said, well, yes, but it was far too good for him. So that doesn't surprise me what you say about Beethoven. I'm sure there was a lot of pinching went on. And as I say, Beethoven himself was worried that he'd actually pinched Mozart stuff. Yeah, pl plagiarism, the, the, the best form of flattery really, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, do you know, Alan, if Milos Foreman, the director of Amadeus, was a mason? I don't. Uh, I was asked that question the last time I did this, and I said, I'm going to look it up. And, you know, I totally forgot all about it. But I'll definitely make a note now. Um, no, I, I don't know if he was a if he was a Freemason. Um, there's not a lot of Freemasonry comes out in Amadeus. In fact, they don't really mention Mozart's uh, Freemasonry. So I'd imagine probably that he wasn't, because if I'd been directing the film, there'd have been a few aprons flying around. How many melodies did Mozart write during his time as a Mason? Um, well, if you look at the, the stuff that was that was in the presentation, it's around about 20 different pieces are written specifically for Masonic rites. Um, mm. There are a number of songs that I, I, you know, I assume that the brethren in his lodge, he, he will have taught to them and, uh, and they will have sung his, his particular melodies. Um, but yeah, there's about 20 pieces specifically written for Freemasonic rites. Okay, and as a follow-up question for that from Eagle again, how many signs did Mozart give during his compositions of Freemason as an apprentice, as a fellow or a master? How many signs or signals within the music? Is there many what, that are quite obvious? Do you mean that it was that it was Masonic music? Yeah. Well, I mean, the titles of them specifically say that it was Masonic music, but like the Magic Flute, there's a lot of threes in them, a lot of the number three uh, okay. in them. Funnily enough, um, probably because probably because he, he couldn't say that the Magic Flute was a free Masonic opera because it had been flung in jail because the emperors had, had banned Freemasonry um, and it was, it was kind of underground at the time. Um, but before she was there, when he was when he was writing Masonic music, he was simply calling it Masonic music. So he wouldn't necessarily have had to make it to have imbued it with all sorts of kind of secret signs and symbols. The way he had to make a secret of it with the magic flute. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Tom Edgar asks: Are his compositions displayed in a museum any place? Do you mean original scores? The original. Yeah. Yes, uh -huh. uh, all over the world, actually. Um, many museums have them. Um, obviously, in Vienna, there are a number uh, of Mozart original scores, but the British Museum has some museums in, in the, the Louvre will have some. Yeah, I mean, Mozart's, um, Mozart's stuff, because of when Mozart died, um, and he died suddenly, um, it, there was an enormous interest in him, in him immediately. And his stuff was preserved. Um, so because of that, th there is still quite a, a, a few bits and bobs left. Well, that's good. I think a uh, gorgeous Paul comments about the time when you were given the quotes about from the, the other famous uh, composers. Not bad references. Uh, so I would, <laughs> I would agree with that. Uh, 
from Brother Sandy Thompson, what was Mozart's motivation for writing Eine Kleine Nacht music? Um, Mozart wrote music because I believe the music came to him. I think Mozart was given the music by, I think Einstein's quite right. I think it was given the music by the universe. I think it was given the music by God. Um, and I think when he wrote pieces, it was because he was utterly inspired to write pieces. If someone said to him, I'm going to commission you to write an opera, he would go straight away and start writing an opera. But I think Mozart would be sitting there and suddenly an idea would come to him and he would go and write it down. So there's a distinction between certain pieces that he wrote. He would have written some pieces, for instance, because he had his concert series. So he thought to himself, I'm going to write some new pieces for next Sunday uh, for my concert series. And he would have written things like that. But even though he would have had an impulse to do it because he had a deadline, I still believe that for the majority of his pieces, he just wrote them from sheer inspiration. Yeah, well, I think you can practice music, but I think it's a God-given talent that not every one of us is blessed with. Well, certainly uh, for him, no one's blessed with that talent. Yeah. Brother Ian Walk certainly got his uh, magnifying glasses on this evening, and he notes about the painting within the lodge that uh, Mozart uh, and uh, his... Schickenader. Uh, that's I was looking for my notes here, yeah. Emmanuel Schickenader uh, were wearing swords in the lodge. How yes. terrible. It was dangerous back then, surely. I've, I've noticed that um, as well, and I don't know if that was typical of the time. Um, certainly we know nowadays that there'd be no weapons of, um, of offence or defence, um, basically uh, worn by brethren now, but certainly uh, that painting shows that they were, they were certainly um, carrying weapons. It was a time, of course, of uh, the Anglo-Austrian War. So it's possible that every man had to carry a sword at the time, but I don't, if I'm being perfectly honest, I have noticed that, but I don't know is the answer okay. to that. But there's uh, something for somebody to look up. Definitely, we'll see what we can find out. A couple of plaudits for you. Absolutely superb, Alan. Excellent presentation, Alan. Brilliant. Uh, another question from Newfoundland from Eagle. Did he make Masonic music for the kings of Egypt's Thames? I'm not. 100% sure what Eagle's meaning there, but uh, you might know some of these references, Alan. For the for the kings of Egypt. Uh, so, I, if I may, Eagle, yeah. Uh, I came across uh, that uh, uh, he also made. Uh, uh, let me see. He also made uh, music uh, for. Uh, uh, where am I? Uh, music for uh, his music to Tom, uh, Tom's King of Egypt uh, also had the Masonic connections. Something I came across. I uh, just uh, wondering if you you know any more about that. No, I've never never heard of any of that. To be honest, how do you, is it Thames T H E M E S? T where am I? T H A M O S. So he was the, the, the Egyptian Egyptian king, Eo, yeah. yeah. Did you mean, did he write a piece about Tamos? Yeah, uh, uh, no, it did say two. No, I've no idea. No idea. Sorry. That's, yeah, a, nice, I, that's a nice little research piece for Eo to, to yeah. do some delving and feedback to Alan for us. So, uh, I, 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 uh, If I may, uh, I did uh, do a little piece... Uh, on uh, Masonic composers, and uh, that's what I came across. Uh, by, by the way, in Scandinavia, they uh, all wear swords during the, some, uh, most of the Greece. Ah, interesting. interesting. After these Vikings are dangerous people, though. We, we know that, <laughs> us Scots. Uh, so, uh, so, some more plaudits for you, Alan. Bravo, that was outstanding. Well done. Uh, and that, my brothers, is a presentation. Fantastic, superb, outstanding, superb. Uh, David, a tremendous talk and so very interesting and informative. Why was he bu buried in a pauper's grave? You would have thought his rich Masonic friends would have given him a send-off befitting his stature. 
Um, there's there's two st- there's kind of uh, two schools of thought about it. One is that that was typical of the time, uh, and another school of thought is that basically when he died, um, he was still in debt. The magic flute had just had just happened. Um, he was still in debt, but literally the, the the day, the week after his death. The debts were paid off because of the money from the magic flute kept on coming into his wife. Um, but it's very, very possible that at that particular time, there just simply wasn't the money. Um, but yeah, why wouldn't have his Masonic friends um, got him a fabulous grave in the middle of Vienna, et cetera, et cetera. There are no records to say why uh, that's the case, but he is in an unmarked grave outside the walls of Vienna. It's terrible. Sadly. Terrible. Thank you, Brother Alan, for a memorable presentation, a wonderful story about a wonderful brother, and what a treat for us to have an aria in the middle of a lecture about the craft. So (laughs) there you go. That's from uh, Brother John White. Uh, Brother Joe Priest, uh, well done, Joe, for your VED commemorations up in Cooper. I saw the photographs this evening. Uh, Joe asks, as an operatic tenor, do you have to be fluent in Italian, German, French, etc.?" Or do you just have to learn the words to the songs? Um, interesting question. You you obviously need to pronounce the language like a native. Um, if your career is simply in an English-based country, then you don't have to learn the language. But if your career, I mean, I went to Germany and had to learn German. Uh, when I went to Stuttgart, uh, simply because all the rehearsals were were conducted in German. Um, everything was done in German because it was Germany. So if you want to work in Germany in an opera house, then, you know, you'd better learn the, the German language. And of course, I was singing a lot of German. Um, because because Beck is a name which um, which is kind of overall Europe. There's a lot, you look at the, the, the Stuttgart uh, telephone directory, there's loads of Becks in it. So people would see my name when I started at the Opera House and they would think, oh, Herr Beck, you know, comes from, comes from Berlin or somewhere. Uh, and because I had good pronunciation, because I'd been singing in German for, for a long time, and because I went to live with a German family and I did a language course, I could do the first kind of five minutes of conversation with people because it's all the same things you say. Hello, my name is uh, Alan Beck. I'm, I'm living in Suffenhaus and I'm a tenor here at the Opera House, etc. And I could say all those extremely well in German and with really good pronunciation. And because my name was Beck, people would just automatically assume that that you were German. And then I'd have to say, Entschuldigen Sie bitte, können Sie ein bisschen langsamer sprechen, which means can you speak a little bit slower? And you could see the kind of expression going across the face where they're thinking, why is Herr Beck, who obviously is from Berlin, why is he asking us to speak more slowly? Um, so just to get by in, in a country, or certainly for me anyway, I felt that if I was going to Germany, I had to learn German. And if I'd been going to do the same job in France, I'd have, I'd have gone to a, a language school to learn some French. Um, it's obviously a lot easier if you can pronounce the language and you've been singing in the language because you recognise so much of the vocabulary because you've been singing about it and, you, and you've looked at the translations. But um, I would say that, yes, you, 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 really, you really have to get a, a basic grounding of the language because if you go to a country, um, the, the opera is going to be directed, all the rehearsals are going to be taken in that language. You know, I would certainly agree with, with you there about learning the language, Alan. I, I think I came back from Germany with uh, a couple of phrases. Zwei grosse Bier, bitte. <laughs> uh, Alan, outstanding. Thank you so much. So many dimensions of our craft and particularly the prose with which his fellow composers expressed in them. Uh, Ian Walk asks about a Coronach that is played in Grand Lodge. And he asks, was that written by Mozart? I don't think so. Uh, I don't think so. But there's another thing for me to look up. Mm-hmm. Ask him why he thinks that. Why do you think that? Just Ian. because it's so inspiring and just because it sort of lifts, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. You've got the undertones and then the lifts. Yeah, yeah, no, I totally agree with you. It just seems like most art. From... I would totally agree. I don't with... know anything about music, I must admit. The, I, can't uh, sing, I can't play anything. 
I'll I'll definitely look it up. I don't I don't think it is, but I'm not going to swear to it. I'm not going to swear to it. I mean, um, you know, I, I I know a lot about Mozart, <laughs> but uh, there are limits to everybody's knowledge about anything. Um, but um, certainly, it's not one of the. It's not a piece that I recognise as a Masonic piece of music by Mozart. And amongst my poppy girl CDs, Alan, I, let's see, Coronach. This is a the Scottish Masonic ritual music available that Simon Naminsky did. And let's see if it's got Coronach on the back, because it would should say who wrote it. I, I would think. I, No, it's not there. Oh, yeah, Barrett Coronach, Extract. Right. So, memorial music. Not what's that then? No. So, uh, well done, Alan. Uh, Ron Mann asked, was that a broken column at the end in your presentation? I think that certainly was. Yes. A drawing yes. of that. Um, Uh, from Howard uh, to everyone, an outstanding presentation, magnificent. That was perfection. It has opened my eyes to Mozart's music, which until now I did not think about in the same way. Uh, well, the that is the best thing I've heard. That's fantastic. I love the idea that people have listened to me and they want to go and hear mo more Mozart. I think that's fantastic. You've go done and watch your Amadeus because it's brilliant. Chaz Black, uh, the first degree in continental masonry has a circle of swords as part of the ceremony. Could explain the sword. Uh, another yep. great presentation. James Watson, if you Google Tamos, King of Egypt, it states Mozart wrote incidental music for it, first performed in 1774. There you go. Uh, there you go. Thank you, James. Uh, excellent presentations. Uh, Doug, uh, swords are used in the Bristol workings. When the inter apprentice is readmitted, he's told to sit at the table and write those secrets. As he holds the pens at the ready, he's rushed at with the drawn swords. Powerful stuff. And Laird Allen Maitland, I must go, Brian. Thanks again. And I think at that point, it's very fitting that I, once again, Brother Alan Beck, past master of Lusgrenic number 12, thank you so much, sir, for entertaining us this evening on one of your passions. I know Burns is a big passion and Masonry is a big passion, but your love of music certainly comes through this evening. Thank you very Bren, much. Thank you, Alan. Brian, before I, we allow you to say your personal thank yous to, to Alan, I, next week we've got Brother Stephen Harrison, He's coming over from America. We've had a few American speakers recently, Brian. Uh, but Brother Steve's going to talk to us about the Masonic aspects of Oak Island. And if you don't know what Oak Island is, uh, you've never watched the History cha Channel, uh, where these rich billionaires who've made their money in oil and gas uh, are, are looking for the, the, the hidden gold. Uh, and when you watch it, you can see lots of Masonic stories. Uh, they've got lots of Masonic baseball caps on these brand who are chasing this hidden gold. So they're going to come. Stephen Harrison's coming along to speak to us next week, Brian. So that will be seven o'clock. Uh, tomorrow, uh, one o'clock, we've got the Grand Lodge of Scotland History and Heritage Group. The view from over there. And we've got uh, a brother from uh, Gibraltar talking to us about the Freemasonry uh, on the southern tip of Spain. So, Brian, please unmute yourself and say your thank yous, congratulations, and good nights to each other, but in particular to Brother Alan Beck. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Alan. Brilliant, Alan. Really good. Absolutely brilliant, Alan. Wonderful. Thank you, Brother. Thanks, Alan. Alan, thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thanks, brethren. Thanks. Thanks, brethren. Well done, Alan. Thank yes. you, Alan. Superb. Superb. That was Mr. magic. It was well, definitely in, enlightened me on the magic flute. Thank you very much, Alan. Great. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Alan. Fantastic. Thank you. Excellent. Well done. Well done. The most enjoyable night, Alan. I thoroughly enjoyed that. You even Thank had a haircut, Alan. Yeah, your haircut special. <laughs> Thanks again, oh, Alan. I well really enjoyed that. Very educational. I look forward to listening to some more Mozart. Thank you.
Thank you. That's lovely. Thank you. Alan, superb. Thank you so very much. Do, Thank do you. you. Do you know the, the piece he, he wrote for his father to his uh, second degree? Which, which one? Uh, it, when his father got his second degree. Yeah, but what's it called? I, that's what I'm wondering. Oh, I see. Uh, all right. Uh, I mean, I've, I've, I've listened to all of Mozart's Masonic music, but I, but I wouldn't know which one was actually written for his father's... Uh, he, I'd he, be he surprised. Did write, he, he did write, uh, uh, like uh, Mozart uh, uh, joined uh, the Masons before his father. And, right. uh, but to, to his... To his father's <coughs> he wrote the piece. I'm not sure what, what, it, what the not name. Not sure which one. Nope. Well, you know, Google's a wonderful thing. <laughs> Great invention. <laughs> Terrific invention. Yeah. Thank, thank you. It was excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Brian, I'll give you five. Thanks, Alan. That was wonderful. Take care, brother. I'm all... Take thank care, you. everyone. Good night, brethren. Good night. Thank you very much, Alan. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you. Good night, and three. Brethren. Stay safe. Cheers, Gordon. Adio. Alan, and two, brethren. Alan, do you have another one? Another lecture? Aye. Uh, I'm, I'm doing one just now, not about Mozart, but about a Burnsian who was a member of a local lodge here, a very eminent Burnsian. Yeah, you do a pretty good presentation. Thank you. That's very kind of you. Thank you. I might speak to you about that afterwards, Alan. So, <laughs> and one, Brian. Get, get in there, Gordon. That's it. Eh? <laughs> Never leave anything hanging in front of me. That's it. Absolutely. Uh, uh, <laughs> Brother Alan Beck, once again, on behalf of the members of Lodge for Karachi in our lockdown lecture series, thank you so much. Thanks Good evening, Brian. Thank you.